Good morning, and um, thank you very much for coming. It's just lovely to see so many people here to celebrate this. Uh, I think it looks great. Ballyprint are responsible for um, printing it for us, and uh, I think they did a very good job. Um, so uh, one thing I think I should I'll make clear right at the start, it is a new edition of the book. It's not an update. We have not changed or added to Charles Brett's original text. What we have done, however, is added, as it says, new introductory material and also new photographs. Now, um, it's hard actually to know where to start to talk about this book. It's hard to talk about the content because it is literally a TARDIS of a book in terms of what it's about. It's also hard to thank everybody who's involved. So what I thought I'd do was tell a little bit about the history of the publication and the republication and explain how some of the people were involved and thank them along the way, if that's okay. So the first edition, which many of you probably own, was published in 1997. Uh, it was published with some support from the Ulster Architectural Heritage Society, uh, of which Charles Brett was a very active member and uh, also with our own Glens of Antrim Historical Society. The publishers were lagging press. My dad bought me a copy of it as a present. In 1997, he was 70, I was about 40, and he bought a copy for me and for various other members of the family because I think he realized just how important, how significant it was. And I'm so glad that he did because really very quickly, this book sold out, the copies became hard to obtain. Um, I, I became aware of just how hard to obtain they were because I wanted to give a gift and I asked local book dealers about it and a couple of people looked on the internet for me and there were copies selling on the internet for up to 30 pounds each. This is sort of five years ago. Um, and, and that was when you could get them. So, we in the Building Preservation Trust began to talk about the idea, wouldn't it be nice to get this book back into print? But how do you do that? You know, the, the first thing is publishers, the original publishers were called Lag and Press. Lag and Press as such doesn't exist anymore. It was taken over and subsumed into an organization called Verbal, which is associated with the Verbal Arts Center in Derry. And they acquired the uh, copyright and the back catalog. So uh, then we, we also had the issue of copyright holders and there are two main copyright holders to this book, obviously Charles Brett and his descendants and Michael O'Connell, the photographer. I didn't know who Michael O'Connell was at all. And I started asking around, asking people who might know. And um, in the end, not with too much difficulty. I think I put a note through Michael's door. Michael is here this morning and he's really the first person that I want to say thank you to. I'm jumping ahead a wee bit because we had to first of all get permission and we got permission very readily and very generously from Adam Brett, who's Charles Brett's son. Once we had that, we could go ahead. We went to Verbal, who had acquired Lag and Press, and they gave us their official permission not to stand in the way if we were to do a new edition. Then I, I traced Michael and Michael not only said, oh, that's a great idea. And yes, you have my permission. But he said, I'd like to take some new photographs for it. And he wasn't charging us any money to take these new photographs. Now, if you're unsure whether you're going to buy a copy of this book or not, or whether you're going to buy two copies of this book, just turn to page 15 and look at the photograph of Christian Dunn. And I think that might help you to make up your mind. The, the new photographs are absolutely stunning. They're a, a really lovely addition to the book. Um, so what else did we want to add to it to, to give people something new? Well, because Charles Brett sadly was no longer around, we wanted to explain a little bit about who he was and why he had written this book. And that was where the next big thank you person comes in. That's James Morrow. James, could you give a wave, let people know who you are? This is Dr. James Morrow, who not only researched quite a lot into Charles Brett's background and wrote us a lovely essay to, to introduce the book, but he also was just a great um, support, a, a kind of advisor and 
solid rock for us when we were doing this because we, we had begun the process and then COVID happened and we weren't sure was it going to go ahead like lots of things but in the end it, it all came together so um James's um, essay is, is another something new that's in the new edition. And the other new thing we're absolutely delighted is Randall McDonnell has written a foreword for it. So I'm really pleased to have Randall associated with the book. Um, I'm going to say something more now if I've got time about the content and about this idea of the book being a TARDIS. Is that okay? Have I got time? Right, excuse me a second. It really covers a, a tremendous amount of ground. Each of those five houses could be the subject of a novel and maybe will be at some stage. The point about the literary associations is that most of them have been mentioned in writing by various people. And uh, I think Charles Brett, as, as James brings out in his essay, realized that this was a bit special. There was something going on in this little local area. And something that, that I'm just very, very sorry that Charles Brett's not here today. I would love to be thanking him in person. Um, something that I think was particular to his approach was he was somebody who in his life and in his work um, kind of managed the connection between the big picture and the local and the particular. Um, I'm going to read very, very quickly the, the opening paragraph of the entry on him from the Dictionary of Ulster Biography, which gives you an idea of his kind of big picture work. Sir Charles Brett was a major figure in Ulster public, professional, cultural and artistic affairs. He was a senior partner with the family firm of solicitors. He was involved in politics, including a spell of time as chair of the Northern Ireland Labour Party. He served on numerous public bodies uh, and, and it goes on to tell you that he was a chair of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. He was the first chair of the Ulster Architectural Heritage Society. Um, and uh, he was, it says here he's probably best remembered for being dedicated to the restoration and reuse of the built heritage throughout Ulster and as an architectural historian, an expert on that heritage. Um, and uh, Michael, who worked with him on not only this book, but numerous other books that he produced, says they were working for the best part of 10 years, traveling around County Armagh, County Down, Belfast, County Antrim, photographing and, and compiling um, indexes, indices of old books of what have come to be called buildings at risk. And it's fantastic that we have these. The, the buildings of County Antrim is a, a lovely one. There's buildings of Belfast, um, buildings of County Armagh. And there's, there's a, one on the glens of Antrim, I think, um, which is in a, a, a paper type format. Um, so he was working on that for years and years. And as, as James points out, it was in the process of compiling these records that he um, came across Cushion Dunn, and I think he kept coming across Cushion Dunn. So um, we're really lucky. I think we're lucky. We know we're lucky to live in Cushion Dunn. We're lucky to have these lovely houses. Um, what um, James refers to as the built things that have slipped seamlessly into the natural environment. I think that sort of sums up very nicely how we would feel about them. Um, and, and we're lucky that we had somebody like Charles Brett who wrote about it. So, yeah, uh, thank you if you're around anywhere, Charles Brett. Um, so that's, that's um, a little bit about him. And why did I use the word TARDIS about the book? Well, it's not just because of the houses and the stories of the houses themselves. It's, it's, it's about him. I mean, I, when I started reading this book, I realized I want to read something else by him or about him. And James lent me a book called Long Shadows Cast Before, which I would also recommend, which is a kind of cross between autobiography and history. And that is just so interesting. And then I read a book called A Lady's Child. And A Lady's Child is written by Enid Starkey, who is the middle picture there on the back of the book. I didn't know anything about her until I read this book. A Lady's Child is an absolutely lovely 
restrained, elegant autobiography of um, a young woman growing up in the early years of the 20th century. And she happened to spend a couple of very memorable summers in Cushendon. Um, so there are just sort of so many reasons to read it and it gives you so many starting points to kind of jump off and find out about other things. And then as Randall points out in his foreword, and I think he's going to say a little bit more about this aspect too, um, it is, it should be a stimulus to understanding the history of our own area, the, the kind of economic and social history, the pattern of life, this big house model of society that just doesn't exist as such anymore. Um, so yes, I think we've really got something to celebrate. We are lucky and we're lucky to have the book back. We've printed lots and lots of copies of them, so we don't um, intend to hit that problem of them running out and people not being able to obtain copies. We'll, we'll have copies around, we hope, for a good long time now. Uh, so I, I said I was impressed by Charles Brett um, being someone who made and kept in mind the connection between the big picture and uh, the, the local level. And um, another person who does that and has really done that all his life, uh, including public service to us as a local councillor and as chair of our local authority is Randall McDonnell. And he has written a foreword to this book. He's going to speak to us now. I'll hand you over to him. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, or a dame monsieur, or a wee nouche, if you like. Um, we're here really, and I'm here to, to, to encourage you to appreciate, number one, the book, and number two, the efforts of the uh, Preservation Trust in getting the thing reissued or relaunched, or what would you call it, <laughs> get back into print, because it really was such a good book. It'd be a terrible pity if everything were lost. Now, the origin of this book seems to have been um, Sir Charles Brett's um, compilation of the, the uh, historic buildings and group of buildings of architectural importance and so on in the Glens of Antrim, dating from 1971. And it seemed to have been smouldering about in his breast somewhere and eventually came to life um, in the way it did. Um, the, what we are celebrating, of course, is, as I say, the book and the efforts of the Trust. And uh, I certainly would like to express thanks to, to, to the Trust for their efforts and to Michael McConville and, of course, also to uh, Dr. Morrow for his help in the matter. Now, buildings are not just masonry. Big houses are part of the social strata of the past which has passed. Nowadays, we're all democratic and we're all equal and all the rest of it. But there was a day when um, the peasants populated the country, the landowners owned huge estates, they planned it, they operated it, and they had to live somewhere. And the houses survived for many, many years, and um, they were effectively the powerhouses. They were military and revolutionary powerhouses in many cases, they were political powerhouses, People passed through them over the generations. People sometimes rented them, but they were associated with people and their history does stimulate you. A local government, as we know it now, didn't exist till 1898. Prior to that, the grand juries ran the country and they provided the public services like roads and bridges and harbors and all that sort of thing. But uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, the really truly important thing was planning. Nowadays, we have to put up with planning. In those days, the states planned themselves. We look at the countryside, it's a patchwork. We look at the towns, we look at the villages, we look at the shapes of them. That was all laid out because all land was owned by landlords and the least two tenants who were compelled to do the thing in the, in the manner in which the estates ordered them. That is why you see strips of farms up and down the hills. That's why you see straight streets. That's why you see roads realigned and all sort of things done to them. And those people were big house people. There was also the question of economic development or economical powerhouse. For Christian Don, for example, 
the McNeils were here and they were agents for the White Estate. And then there was a Crumlin Estate over on Sleans on the other side of the river. And the, by the, the McNeils, they were basically landowners. But the, uh, the Crumlin Estate tried to set up an industrial estate here in Christendon. They actually tried to rationalize the old arrangement for many years, for in fact 200 years, there was a daily ferry service from Cushendon to Dunaverty. There was a passport and customs office here, and they tried to revive all that. They tried to, they did in fact build Newton Crumlin, they realigned the road out to the top of Glendon, they planned a big harbour around uh, down below where the hotels or the apartments are, and it didn't really come to much, but the plans were so extensive that they even took the trouble to build a church for the influx of workers who were coming. Effectively, it was a Presbyterian church. I don't know why it was that, but anyhow, because um, the the Crumlin seemed to be Church of Ireland adherence, but that's that's neither here nor there. It didn't last very long because the whole thing came to naught, and the big developments didn't happen except there were a set of mills built. Now, our hotel, for example, the Christian Don Hotel, that's part of a complex of a steam-driven mill, which actually included a spinning mill, a, a starch mill. A, Scotch mill, uh, supposedly a, a rope works. I don't know when they ever made ropes. And well, it wasn't very economic and like a lot of the Crumlin projects. And if you're really interested in the Crumlin matter, you can look at the museum and the town hall in Lisburn, but they came to very little in the end and eventually, well, formed the basis of the hotels which came there in the end. But they were the, power, the powerhouses. Um, they also, the big houses also provided members of the grand jury, who were in fact responsible for all those, what is nowadays local government functions and the magistracy and of course, military and revolutionary matters. There were all sorts of strange people came through all sorts of strange houses and they had all sorts of strange habits like Countess Markowitz and Roger Casement and so on. They were, they were involved very largely in the, uh, the, 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 the uh, what do you call the, cultural revival at the end of the 19th century and so on. But anyhow, that's enough talk about that. There are, there's, there's, uh, this is described as five houses. We're not talking about the structure, the masonry, we're talking about the people far more than the houses, including the literary matters. Now, one of the houses does not exist, Christendon House, it was burned in 1928, the site cleared, and that was the end of that house. Later on, the backyard buildings were converted to a house, which might be called Cushendon House, and recently converted to another rather strange house, but apparently an architecturally significant house around there. You can see it if you like. But that, that was the, but the old Cushendon House was burned. Now, the other houses, of course, that were left, they survived, but they are. Um, three of them also were burned in their time. Glenmona was burned in 1922 for revolutionary reasons and connected with the so-called War of Independence. Um, um, uh, Glendon Lodge was burned in 1979, I think it was. And uh, the Cave House was burned at some, some time at the end of the 19th century. Um, it's a strange thing, but... Um, um, the only one that, that was never burned seems to be in Rockport. The, um, the fire I remember in, in uh, being at the uh, at Lenton Lodge when it was been burning, I remember there was a new moon and through the flames and the smoke you could see the new moon, or sorry, the full moon, full moon looking through at us as we watched the fire happening. Um, um, when did I say, I said Glen, Glen Mona was burned in 1922, yes, that's right. I've gone over all those things, so I need to go over them again. Um, if I would, if you could get the length of that book, please, for a moment. I'll be a little bit playful for a moment. Sir Charles dedicated to, to whatever ghosts may or may not haunt Cushion Dunn. Well, are there, oh, are there ghosts? Now, the book includes the um, photograph which was taken 
the day after or the morning after the burning of Christendon House and shows a figure which Miss Ada McNeil um, identified as her grandfather, Edmund Alexander McNeil, that his ghost, he was long dead at that time, he was there. Now, that's a ghost print, as I call it. Now, there's another ghost print associated with Christendon House. When I was young, my aunts used to tell me that when young men and young ladies or fellows and girls, uh, in defiance of the decrees of the parish priest, used to go out at night walking in the dark around there. Uh, I don't know what they were doing, but apparently there used to be the ghostly sounds of the gravel crunching under the hooves of the horses and the carriage wheels of the coach that left Christendon House in 1898, carrying Jack McNeil, a cousin of Lord Christendon, and his coachman. They were going to Ballycastle. The coach went into Lacharima, and the bodies were recovered the next day. It was said that you could hear the ghostly sounds of the horse leaving Christendon House if you were I have whatever it is, lucky or unlucky. I do remember uh, uh, somebody telling me about what that led to at one stage, or maybe it led to. Maura O'Neill wrote a poem, Lacharima. The final lines are, well, once before the morning light, the horse moon will come riding round and round the one green island, no one there to see. Well, I don't know whether that was uh, inspired by that particular ghost or whether it was something else. But I remember also being told that there were two visitors staying in the hotel one time and they had read this and they decided to go up at night to Lacharima to see if they could experience a ghost. Some of other people had heard that they had this stunt was going on, so they preempted it by going up with sheets with the intention of being ghosts. The trouble was that we were there a certain length of time and they got scared and eventually had to be rescued by the other people. <laughs> now, if you go to Glendon Lodge, I remember standing outside Glendon as it burned, I didn't see anything. Some two or three people said that they saw a figure at the south wing looking out, of, looking out the window. And of course, was it a ghost? Well, maybe so. Who was it? But of course, some political romantic decided it was Sir Roger Casement because he had had an associate with Ada McNeil. The trouble was that Glendon Lodge wasn't occupied by Ada McNeil till some years after Casement's death. It wasn't Casement that was there that night, or I don't think there was anybody there that night. Um, then there's uh, Glenmona. Well, if you look at Lord Christendon's grave out the back here, you will see that the grave is slightly out of alignment. Now, is Lord Christendon turning in his grave? Now, that's a question. Now, after his death in 1934, the house was let out, probably at other times too, but it was let out, and um, uh, it was eventually led to an order of Catholic nuns, the Mercy nuns. They used to come in the summer. They used to even have bathing boxes on the beach, and uh, you would see a long black clad figure coming out now and again went to the sea. But anyhow, um, they had a chaplain with them and he used to stay in the hotel and he went over every day to be nice to them. And they said mass in, in, in Lenmona in the morning and village people were invited to come and my cousins and I used to go too. We were very young at the time. But of course there was an incentive because after mass, the nuns used to give us some really, really nice homemade lemonade. But anyhow, there we are. Lord Christendon was spoken of as the first potential Prime Minister of Northern Ireland instead of Sir James Craig. And what happens with an order of Catholic nuns in his house? What's even worse is they're saying mass in his library. <laughs> maybe he was turning. Maybe that would happen that grave. And where, what house have I forgotten? The cave house. Well, the cave house... There's only one ghost print there, and that's in the Ordnance Survey map of 1830s. It shows a figure of the intended Port Crumlin Harbour, which was going to be, if the Crumlin pro project had worked out, a new harbour for Ballymena and a re revival of Cushendon and potentially the renaming of Cushendon to Port Crumlin. 
which never happened, but it's there in ghostly form. The only other house we have left is Rockport. Well, now, there are so many strange associations with Rockport that I don't understand why there wouldn't be a ghost in Rockport. <laughs> but apparently there isn't. Though, mind you, sometimes you would have thought it. Uh, the last few occupants of Rockport seem to be so flamboyant that every Christmas, not only would they have firework displays, but also light the whole buildings up. Now, to remind you of the fact that Sir Cecil McKee was there for some years, and Sir Cecil McKee had a strange history. There was even a public inquiry involved in some of his antics while he was um, mayor of Belfast. He was not, of course, um, held accountable for anything. He had done nothing wrong, as far as you know, but he was associated with the Reasoned Oil Company and planning permission. And sometimes you think it was a Reasoned Oil uh, filling station that was over at the other end of the beach. No, that's not really a ghost print either. Well, thank you all for coming and uh, thank you for listening to my ramblings. But that's what I do. Uh, and uh, anybody who's read any of my rambling, my books, including Randall's Ramblings, would know that uh, my books are ego trips, but, <laughs> but not, not Sir Charles Brett. It's a really good, nice, decent, respectable book. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Hmm? Yes. And uh, yes, so the books and they are going to be available outside. And uh, thanks again to the, well, I have forgotten something, the National Heritage Lottery Fund, who have <laughs> been continually supporting us from, from day one and have really been on board. So thanks very much to everybody. And you're, you're welcome to hang about outside. I think the rain has, has settled up so we can unmask and head outside for a breath of fresh air. So thank you very much.